Hey everybody, Dan here from Sherp ET. We hired Whitetail Habitat Solutions to come out and do an evaluation of the hunting properties that we go on um, to try to figure out where to place tree stands, where are the actual routes, what types of crops should we be planting, what types of food sources should we be um, trying to focus on, what kind of water sources do we have, that type of thing. So it's going to be a pretty exciting day. I'll try to hopefully at the end of this video show you what the report kind of looks like. So right up there on the left, it's Ryan from Whitetail Habitat Solutions again. Um, everybody is here from the hunting party because we are about to go out and check out what's going on. And we'll kind of go from there. So quite a few different vehicles that we're using to do this whole thing. I believe the day today is, uh, well, it's actually mid-February. I'm not sure what the date is. Keep your eyes peeled. This is a fairly steep hill right here, and we're bouncing one-wheel drive on this. Come on, baby. Stuff falling out of the stuff. Woohoo! We made it. Did you catch all that? Yeah. There was a range. It's, I got it. Right Likely you figured this out already, but this is focusing on whitetail deer. We drove around about 500 acres and we stopped a number of different times and checked out uh, everything. And you'll hear about that as the video kind of progresses. I attempted to catch as many of the main points as I could. It would be a matter of dropping trees, the more mature trees in there that are not valuable, and then inching trees underneath. Oh, here, if you can hinge ash underneath and get sunlight to them, then they'll stay alive and allow a lot more of that regen to take place. But, you know, this is just right now, it's kind of a dead couple of acres. It'd be nice if you could um, get three or four deer to bed out on this hillside. So it's just a matter of getting that. Do we want to layer it? As far as kind of like a line of no, you know, I would think of it more as just chaos. Like yeah, you know, okay. get out. You know, some of the the bigger crown, like uh, uh, an oak tree like this, no timber value. It's blocking a lot of sunlight. Right? If you could cut that guy, it's gonna fall over and allow a lot of into that pocket down there. So you kind of gotta just look south and go. Okay, this tree is taking on a lot of sunlight. If I take that out, now I get you know this thirty yard area that's gonna get sunlight now. Now in there is where you do a little bit. Of and, you know, like you were talking about earlier, as far as tree planting and stuff, you know, over time, if this is a long-term investment for you guys, you're going to have this forever. This would be a great hillside to maybe in those pockets add some uh, white spruce or white pine um, in small pockets where, you know, basically a, a pocket the size that we are here, you do half a dozen trees, two white pine, four spruce, and those white pine are valuable to feed. Um, that thermal cover basically, like, you know, until they get to 15 years old. Then the spruce are a little bit more slower going on that. They'll kind of pick up the slack. But once those those white pines start to go down in value, they'll really take off. So you can imagine a few pockets of that in here okay. would really yep. diversify that structure and oh, offer sure. more thermal yeah. cover. But again, it's a very long-term point. It's more that shotgun approach where, like you were talking about earlier, you know, you guys have planted 12,000 trees or yeah. whatever. Like you can imagine on this hillside here, if you do 250 trees, if yeah. 10 years from now, 75 of those are still alive you could picture what that would look like yeah, it would really sure. be a huge improvement sure. so kind of going yeah. with more of that shotgun approach in here sure. but, yeah you know. we have clear-cut areas i shouldn't say clear-cut but like yeah. you say chaos yeah yeah and you'll see that once we get over yeah. there it's we did a couple of pockets of that and yeah they they like that yeah but it seems like sometimes it's almost too thick they don't that's, they that's, don't they hang the edges right so that's yeah. what i was going to say next is you know, when I said chaos, you know, I don't want you to misconstrue that and think like, okay, we just need to tangle this entire area yeah. up. Yeah. I'm just no. saying like, you know, the pocket here, no rhyme or reason to it okay. is kind of what I meant yep. by that. Gotcha. You still want to be able to get through here so it's not impenetrable. Otherwise okay. those deer are just going to, like you said, use yeah. the edges. Yeah. So like, you know, when you get it all done, maybe you just take, um, you know, from where the focal point is for this tree stand, you have a mock scrape. And then you just meander a trail through there. So you can imagine if you're okay. a cruising buck, you hook up on that yep. trail, you're set checking for does, you wind up at this scrape. Yep. And then if we do discuss a water hole, this kind of like hooks this hole. Yep. Is that to stage them up then? To get the deer to stage up at the pockets? Not, not, not necessarily like stage them up, but like bedding pockets. Like oh. I picture those areas being really efficient where you're gonna have a lot more regen, like this area here, where then you have the structure from maybe you're doing some of those cuttings where you either have hinge cuts or that top from that tree that you cut down is laying there so it gives them structure to bat up against and then they have brows in a little pocket like this where it's 
you know, multiple rows, prickly ash, and then uh, uh, the ash trees that are, you know, putting out all those juice then again, yep. so that they just have more food to bed in this area. Listen to these concepts was just basically absolutely eye-opening. I just think about deer hunting much different than what I did before. And for me, one of the main takeaways is just basically looking at a piece of property like you're a deer. Oh, that little uh, mark right there, that's where we're going to have a future tree stand. So that was one of the things he identified, too, was where to put tree stands, where to put mock scrapes, uh, where to put trails. It was cool. Drive down this all the time, and now it's starting to grow in. You know, you can get really micromanaging, like put out a four foot section on there just to really encourage more use here. Like, deer are just so efficient that way. <laughs> but this looks incredible the way it Yeah, we'd have to open this for the tractors. Oh, sure. Yeah, and it'd be one of those things like I just wouldn't want to mow it, you know, and maintain it every year. Like, let it grow in like this, sure. you know, I mean, and you'd just be able run to run the trees over for the most yep. part, yeah, get through water and then get back out. Yeah, I just like how natural this is. Yeah, I like how there's already a natural edge here for them to work. And if you put well, it on the trail and in way. a couple of years, this is going to be so incredibly thick because just look, it's all ash. Yeah, they're yeah, all going to sure. be on the ground, so all the underbrush is just going to shoot off. Make it cool. No, this is beautiful. That's a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Oh cool, sitting in there. Kick ass. Yeah, so I mean, this would be awesome just to add more potential bedding that's on your parcel. Sure. And then you're, I wouldn't hunt in here. You'd hunt either up above on that ridge or, you know, on that next, you know, basically anywhere along that fence line you guys can hunt up out there. Sure. I really wish you had a tree where we were looking for one up there. Yeah, right on that inside corner. Man, that would have been for sure. Yeah, I would really like this to just hold a few more deer. Sure. And here's that single. Okay, gotcha. You guys want to bomb up there? Take a look. We haven't really been maintaining them sure. in order yeah. to drop apples. Yeah, and like, you know, apple trees in an area like this, I wouldn't worry about. I wouldn't worry about maintaining it because it's not like you've set yourself up for a shot opportunity. You know, it's okay. like if deer are getting apples here, that means that they don't have to get apples in front of your stand. You know, so like I, if, we, if we do that, it'd probably be out on like those food sources. Sure. But yeah. so I would listen. really like to get more of like what this area looks like down here to yep. start to creep up in here. So you want God more of like that. Honey, so do you see? You're I know. Up a little shit. shit. What's that? You see it up here? <clears throat> no, no. I, I think it's just more of that yeah, shotgun approach. You let the sunlight in here, yeah. and what's already in the seed bank is going to spread up through here. So like honeysuckle, ah. really bad invasive, but it offers really good cover. So you can imagine how if you started to get more stemmy shrubs like that up here, it's going to increase the efficiency as far as like shortening how far deer can see, allowing more deer to bed in a smaller area then. Are there some good native shrubberies that will grow? It's not going to outcompete that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that that's always good. Alrighty, right. so this is a pretty good use of a lot of the concepts that we talk about all the time. So if you guys have watched some of the videos, you've probably heard all these concepts 40, 50 times. But we're building really good depth of cover going away from these larger, more substantial food sources. So. We want to pull as many does as we can in tight to those food sources. So we're trying to maximize how many bedding opportunities you have tighter to that food. And that's going to open up more slots basically for bucks to potentially bed as we go away from those food sources. And so we've got, this is probably going to end up being an acre and a quarter uh, of, of greens, maybe an acre and a half. And then we're looking at more like uh, an acre and three quarters uh, to two acres of grains down on that bottom back on this hillside here. Um, that's going to be a really substantial food source compared to what you guys currently have here. Um, and then what I would want to do is offer, these would be those clover plots or patches where you're just kind of like staging those deer before they commit to going out into that larger, more open food source. And we're doing the same kind of thing over on this side as well. Um, and then we're hunting a lot of these outside edges. So you can see, I like to illustrate like all this shaded area in the center here, all this orange. Um, that would be what I consider like your core area. A lot of people refer to that as like their sanctuary where your sight, sound, and scent is going to stay out of 
for the entirety of the season if you're doing things right. So um, all your stand locations are on the outside edges of that so that you're not blowing your wind in there, you're not walking through there uh, and blowing deer out. So that's where as the neighbors hunt and they're blowing deer into here, those deer come in, they find a slot, they have their food source that they're relating to in the evenings. Um, and there's really, as the season goes on, there's no reason for them to leave if you guys aren't kicking them out of those areas. So you should be picking up more deer as the season goes on, they get pressured from other properties and you guys have that food that's gonna be peaking in value more into like November uh, timeline versus, you know, right now, just having this smaller food source here, I really just don't think that there's enough there to keep that focus into November, December. Um, but um, then we're looking at just trying to maximize as much bedding potential as we can in this core area. So there were just a couple areas where we'd want to improve that cover. So these pockets, that's what I kind of illustrated here. Uh, that's where you're just removing some of those canopy trees and adding structure at ground level um, for the side cover for immediate use. And then over time, as that sunlight starts to penetrate in there, those areas should really thicken up with better browse species. Uh, so you're looking at more multiflora, um, raspberries, bramble, greenbrush, um, and then hardwood regeneration. Um, ash, maple, oak even. Um, and that's gonna basically feed those deer during the daylight. They should, you know, they should have everything they need back in their bedding areas and they have their food sources that they're headed to in the evening. So my hope is that this gives you guys a lot more predictable deer movement where in the evenings, we're coming out of these bedding areas and heading towards these food sources. And in the mornings, they're going back into their bedding areas off of those food sources or more mid morning, like cruising in between these bedding areas as those bucks start to search for does. Um, and then these smaller uh, clover patches here, you know, basically just focal points that offer you guys a shot opportunity on. So that's why I wouldn't want to be doing very substantial food here, um, because if we do a big food source here that's really substantial, it becomes very competitive then for doe bedding, whereas I want to pull more of that doe use out towards these bigger food plots. And so you're not going to have five or six doe family groups fighting over a quarter, a third of an acre of clover. Um, so you can imagine a deer come across this, they feed for two, three minutes, grab a few bites, hit a scrape along the side, get a drink of water, and then they're moving on. So you're getting that shot opportunity and then very low likelihood that you're spooking them um, while you're there. And then, Dylan, is that top one, is that the same size as what we got up yeah, there? I would, yeah, I, would, I just wouldn't plant that one road that comes off of it anymore. I would just plant that one little bubble of food that you have there. Um, and then um, water holes, we've got you know, four water holes on a property this size with the different kind of topography that you have, I think is, you know, pretty good use. You know, if you guys could get out and fill one up there, that'd be an awesome spot, but obviously that'd be pretty, pretty impossible for you guys to do. But separating from dry bedding on their way to their evening food sources or just supporting cruising movements along this top ridge with those water sources, I think is going to be huge for giving you guys some mid-morning opportunities as those deer start to run more towards the rut. But, um... And you mentioned cutting some of those lanes to try to make a route like that, is that? Yeah, so like these orange lines, that's what I consider like anticipated deer movement or travel corridor. So like, I by no means do you need to go out and create a hundred percent of these and walk them and have it where it looks like a perfect deer trail. That's why I like to kind of just illustrate having some ends where, all right, you can just imagine deer just funnel towards these, these movements and just based on the topography and cover type changes, they're using those as movements between features on the parcel. So I would just start at stand locations. And you know, this is a good illustration right here because this area is so thick right here. Um, I would wanna just make it so that there's a nice runway through here and that's gonna pick up movement off this inside corner. And then I didn't illustrate, I should have, but there's that edge that changed there where this is all thick and then you get into more like the open hardwoods here. There's another edge there that those deer basically are gonna come to a point right there. Um, so I would just wanna, open those up so that you know deer are very efficient movers if they have a nice three foot wide trail where all the logs are cleared from they're going to start to run those like crazy and i would just start at each stand location and go 40 yards this way 40 yards this way 40 yards this way you know so it kind of brings that x and then right on that x um or t you would that's where you would want to put your mock scrape hanging right over that so every year comes through there it's gonna stop and see who else has been hitting that junction. So pick your stand location first and then do the yeah. trails? Yep, exactly, because like I wanna, you know, you guys are so limited on trees, unfortunately, like I would put the stand in the right tree and then you've gotta move that trail, yet yeah, trail can 
you know, move five, ten yards one way or the other just with opening up or dropping a tree across what's currently there just to block it and then bring it up right past your stand location. Um, and what I would, you know, we didn't talk a ton about it today, but like I would have a mock scrape at every single one of these stand locations. Just a super easy thing you could put up in five minutes and you can't really overdo them. There's probably hundreds of natural scrapes on this property in the fall. So if you guys put out, I didn't even count them, but if that's a dozen stands or whatever, that just bites into what's naturally going to occur anyway. And if, if that vine is hanging there all year long, you can just imagine that just becomes a community scrape that gets repeated all the time. Is there truth to him telling us we have to pee on them all the time? I, I take a leak on them when I first start them. That's about it. And, like, Jeff disagrees with me a little bit on this. He's, he's not a big advocate for using scent. If I'm going past one change in batteries on it, I'll drop some tanks in there because I think, you know, it just piques that interest a little bit. You know, I don't think it's necessarily bring a deer from 100 acres over, but I think it's, you know, going to pique interest and maybe pull deer in from a trail where they would have just blown by, you know. Um, on those two tree stands that are on the south edge there, are, yeah. we, are we talking hopefully getting access from the south? My hope would be that you gain access from if that not, south. Then, I mean, that's a heck of a journey up there, but you had yeah. mentioned being able to drive up and then park the, the yep. buggy about here yep. and then coming up. You know, I would just want to have basically one clean path to get you right to this corner uh, to get to there, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just not a huge fan of leaving all that ground scent, you know, and then when you got to get out yep. midday, you got to come past all that bedding again. Yeah. So that'd be a little bit tougher for me. Yeah. Yeah. This property is a lot tougher to hunt than, sure. than the other ones. Right. Just right. because of access for going up on the hill. Does that all kind of make sense mm -hmm. on board? Anything you don't like about it? Anything you're like, why are we doing this here? What was the yellow? Was that corn? Oh, uh, yellow is switchgrass. So that that's just going to be added screening. Uh, this one, it actually, because it's under that power line and that road's there, yeah. we had talked about doing the scanthus in that one little spot just because you need that extra height under that power line for the for people looking down into that food source from the road. And again, I... It's like 11 feet tall or something like that. It's one of those things, like, some places it works really well, some places it doesn't. I would try it just as, you know... I, I wouldn't want that to be wide open to that road where they can see down in there like they can right now. So something to give a shot. It's not cheap, but I think if it if it does take off and work, I think you're gonna be really happy with the way it turns out. And that's a perennial. Yes. That keeps coming yeah. Back yep. year year. yeah, and it takes like two to three years to really establish and then it gets stronger as it as it gets older. I've seen some places where I'm like, dang, I get it, that looks awesome, and I've seen a lot of places where I'm like, that's not helping you at all. True. You know, so Okay. <clears throat> Worth a shot, I think. Though. Okay. What should we do with the rest of the power line? Just mow it and not plant like. I that? honestly wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't mow it. I mean, you know, I, if you guys need to use it for your access to get into some areas, maybe mow those. But I like that brushy, um, the way it looks up on this side, where you've got like the raspberry growing into there. I think that's awesome. Like that offers your really good browse. You know, and the, all that lines up with your food sources. So, so. stay on that side of the fence, then. <clears throat> Let that grow up. On the power line, we'll just stay on this side for access. <coughs> oh, gotcha. Down here, you're talking. Yeah, down here. Yeah. Were you talking about power line going this way? Uh, just the whole thing because we've been kind of doing it for the kind of for the power company too. But sure. But they they're fine with that. I would say saying. you know one of those like if if it really starts to get overgrown or like trees are growing in it and then you're worried about the power line coming out and completely re you know just say hey i'll take care of this every five years i'll mow it or whatever because yeah. you know it's not going to be a threat to those power lines in five years here or less cool cool See, that's work off your plate now you can walk up the fucking <laughs> and, and this has already been logged so a lot of that cover is going to take care of itself. Um, it should get better and better for the next, I would guess, four to five years. And then at some point it's going to start to peak and go down in value as everything starts to canopy out and choke out that regeneration underneath. So at that time, that's when it might be worth going in and dropping more of like the non-timber trees, just opening the canopy back up as long as Duke's okay with that, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. adding more of that structure. Um, and sunlight, but that's, you know, several years down the road. So this should honestly get better and be able to hold more deer with time. And unfortunately, you know, in, in a perfect world, 
this wouldn't be in CRP and you'd be able to do a lot of food sources here and we'd then do big food here and build a lot of depth going back into here. Um, so this is a little bit of a different one because you guys are gonna have the food here. You're gonna have a lot of deer that bed up here that then relate to this food source and then back in here, now we're getting further away, it's gonna be kind of a split on where these deer end up, either in these ag fields at night or down and across on your guys' lease. I'm curious, like the, 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 that food source that Duke does have over that butterfly thing? This guy? No, the whole butterfly field that he yeah. has over there? What is that stuff, would you recommend any of that for deer? Absolutely or is, not. No, never. okay, no. all right. <laughs> never. Never. Just curious, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's just extremely low value food source that, you know, like we looked at it today, you can see right across it, those deer are obviously not spending any time out there this time of year eating in that. Um, just because that, that food is long gone. So it's good fawning cover, summer food, herbaceous. There's no stemmy browse in there whatsoever. And there's no tubers or anything that are going to last into, you know, even hardly into October. So as October shifts around, that value of this as a food source is next to nothing. That makes um, complete sense. <laughs> so that, that's why it's, you know, it's just kind of a bummer because that'd be awesome to have that in play as far as a huge draw on food source to be able to support a lot of acres, especially this up here that nobody really hunts. So, um, but utilizing what you guys do have here and considering how much better this cover is going to get, I would just kind of shift a lot of your stand locations, you know, and you guys aren't doing a terrible job at this already, but pulling those stands out to the sides and giving as much of this where you're not gonna blow this valley out at all during the season and just hunting those upper reaches of that, I think is gonna be awesome. Um, and I honestly should have uh, continued that out into Sean's here, um, cause that's all valuable cover as well. But um, I honestly think that less is more on a property like this where you don't have as much, um, this is exactly where they're headed to in the evening. This is where they're going to in the morning. That's a little less defined on a property like this because you don't have those food sources. So I would hunt more of the longer range cruising movements and bedding movements. So that's why we're setting up on these ridges and inside corners, just kind of taking advantage of natural movement um, and then utilizing water on these drier areas, you know, the high and dry areas where, you know, those deer don't have water sources for several hundred yards. So that's going to be a thing of convenience. These things are going to get pounded um, as we get later into October into early November. Um, and then just having a small clover plot here is kind of a pass through. Um, again, I don't picture deer spending a half hour on that. Mm -hmm. It's five, 10 minutes, they hit a scrape, take a few bites, and then they're on cruising or heading into bed in the morning. So that's what's cool about a small food source like this is that you can actually get in there and hunt that in the morning since you're not coming through food sources to get there. Um, and you can hunt that basically all day. Um, and then, you know, uh, we talked about this while we were out there, but this ridge, I just love how long um, that ridge is where those bucks can hook up on that at any point and just cruise for several hundred yards. So just having a couple stand locations up there where you're sacrificing a little bit of core area, you obviously got to walk through that to get in and out. Same thing here. Um, so you'd recommend coming around that one? To yeah, get to up? get into that one, I'd okay. probably come up sure. that back side. Okay. Like that. Yep. Um, Depending on wind? Honestly, yeah, the wind wouldn't matter that much because once you're okay. up there, that, okay. that tree that you're in, you're yep. well above the grade. So like you're going to get free winds on that. Okay. Uh, the only wind I wouldn't want to do is like westerlies yeah, that are blowing up. way yeah, down on this. But you can hunt yeah. that on a southeast, a south. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, southwest, south, southeast, east, yeah. northeast, even yeah. probably a straight sure. north. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is just awesome being that you're that high over that ridge. Mm -hmm. The thermals are really advantageous up there. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is still a really good mix of morning and evening stands based on how close to some of the fields you guys are for just popping in, hunting some of those inside corners, natural movements where the movement's pinched up because of the ditch and that corner um, in a lot of these areas, you know, basically those three there is kind of the same, mm -hmm. same MO on all yep. those stand locations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, do you guys have any other questions on this one? This one to me is just a little bit more cut and dry. Okay, so then you're just kind of hunting that outer edge, chipping away um, and using the wind uh, at your advantage because these thermals are gonna carry up out of these valleys really heavily. Um, so staying on that high side really works. And then if you guys are putting in um, improvements on that timber by cutting out some of the ash um, and non-timber trees to open up that canopy and add that structure, if you guys are removing some of those ironwood and stuff like that, that's gonna make a world of difference 
for pulling that bedding. Like these areas right now are pretty dead as far as bedding. So if we can pull deer, you know, 200 yards yeah, up out of that them, bottom, yeah, get them up. To you the guys top. are going to see yeah. a lot more deer starting to use that during the daylight, and that gives bucks way more of a reason uh, on any south winds to cruise this upper edge because then they're scent checking more valuable cover, right? So rather than being like, oh, there's never does up here, I'm going to cruise through this bottom because they're more likely to have does down here. You're shifting those does up towards this food source, gives those bucks more reason to cruise up there too. So when we when we clear an area, do we just leave it as a mess, meaning like throw all the brush into piles? So the, like the the one really good spot to like use as a a target, I guess, would be where Dale cleared all those ironwoods and it just like looked like a tornado went through there. Um, I would just want to make sure that with time you're able to actually go through that. So maybe cut yeah, out some, yeah. notch so, out some yeah. paths uh -huh. through that. Yeah. But like just clearing and leaving that brush is totally fine because that adds immediate side cover. Um, and then obviously those gaps in the canopy are going to want to uh, allow a lot more of that sunlight down to regenerate. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted the brush stuff. pile because they tend to, the bucks tend to back into the, yeah. the brush piles. I think it's more like just kind of you know staggering those cuts so you take the tree down and it lays like this you take a tree down and it lays like this i wouldn't worry about doing it in a pattern because that canopy of that tree is still offering a lot of diversity like structure for them to bed up against so for example like in that spot where dale did that cut all those deer had moved their bedding up into where all those um yeah. <laughs> those like stumps and tops were right so like just having that to bed up against i think yeah. gives them a lot of options mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, then we're looking at doing, I would do this food source here, um, in brassica and greens. So again, splitting it probably just like this and then flipping okay. those every year. Sure. Um, that I think would be awesome doing tilled radish oats and peas on one side and then a brassica mix on the other and just flip flopping those. I think would be we great. We have a lumper crop of corn that's here up there. <clears throat> shut up. <laughs> shut up. The other thing I <laughs> mentioned while we were out there, but if this guy's planting grains, corn, when it's corn, I think it'd be worth buying an acre of corn here from them. You know, having a reason to, again, cement that that movement there later into the season and having that really good draw in gun season and even into like December, if you guys ever get into muzzleloader or late season bow, mm -hmm. if you have an right. acre of standing corn there, that'd be yeah, pretty darn bad. Yeah, then you're solid. Yeah. <laughs> so move that stand out of the corner and move it up to 15, closer to the, move it up towards the, the yeah, I think right now it's probably more here. Well, there's I, normally one in the corner that you probably didn't oh, see. No, yeah, we haven't had that one for a... Well, we, we didn't put it there this year. Last year. Yeah, we didn't put it up mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, there was a couple of uh, walnuts up here that I think you could get in. Um, sure. Where I just like being here where, where then you can hunt in the evening as those deer are coming to this food. And it's still yeah, a, a good reason to hunt that yep. for that post daybreak mm -hmm. where then you're still catching this movement in the sure. interior. Yeah, and that one we're only moving probably 20, 30 yeah. yards, right? Yeah. yeah. Are right you talking the west of that food plot, Chet? Yeah. yeah, Chet had that one down in the southwest. So the southwest. Corner. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, okay. we had one down in there, and yeah, we haven't had that one. In, well, last year, we didn't have it at all last year because we didn't even put it up. But yeah, we um, had one tucked right down in the corner. And that one was tough. Okay. Getting to it and coming out of it, you know, obviously you're, you know, you got deer on top of you, you know, at that point. Um, yeah, we forgot to show you that, that we had one there at one gotcha. time. Gotcha. Yeah, and I would say, like, if it is in here and it's a great spot, like, I would just hunt that in the morning with your wind blowing out into that, right? Like, I wouldn't want to hunt that in the evening and then blow my wind into where I'm expecting those deer to move to. Gotcha. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then this food source here, I would you know take some trees off of that edge like you guys were talking about yep. and i would just do clover there um okay. or perennial i should say um just so that you know that can tolerate a little bit more of that shade i don't see brassica doing really well in there nothing um, goes good there yeah, yeah. <laughs> the biggest problem we have is the leaf cover sure you know, yeah sure. the sun it grows good for a while mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden then when the leaves drop it just snuffs it right right up, right you know. And that's and the I, I, problem. You know, I, I'm a nip, nitpicky when it comes to this stuff. I would move that stand that's up on this side down into here. So that way you're catching more of this interior movement. So mm -hmm. if bucks aren't popping out and going across, you're still getting sure. a shot as they're cruising around yep. where you guys are making all these improvements. Mm -hmm. And then I would shift that water from there out to this side. 
and then there's yeah. that perfect tree, that black walnut right yep. there, and then like yep. we talked about that little like high flat. Yep. I would do in switchgrass, so yep. it like shields that whole area. So I guess they can do that. Oh, that's grass, interesting. I wasn't up like there for that. Talked, there's like, just like that, wide. just that ten yards, you know, maybe sure. fifteen okay. yards sure. swath there, yep. where it's just okay. kind of that yep. high flat. Yep. And that's going to make these deer here feel way more comfortable sure. being like down in that. Like yep, yep. they don't feel Nobody like they're open to this yeah. field, you know? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and we didn't even walk out on this grass for you guys. Sure. But I would what? definitely want to be grass for you adding a lot more of that. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of bedding that can, yeah. be, can be had out there. I like that, that point a lot. And we didn't yep. even walk it. I just could tell it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. They got to be that out there. Yeah. That used to be thicker, and then, yeah, and then the bigger trees got a little bit bigger, and then it kind of yep. shaded them out. But, yeah, if we get in there, I'm sure there's going to be ironwoods and all that. that oh, yeah. Pull out oh, yeah. And, yeah, and some bigger non-desirables. And then this spot here, um, you've got the stand in here currently. Yep. That wall, mm -hmm. I really like. Yep. I, I think yep. that'd be sweet yep. if you guys could go and just kind of create those travel corridors. Yep. Ooh, that's just getting super, super thick. If you would open that up and they would come to that point right there. And then if you could back off there and fill that water. Like, yep, yep. And I think, I think that totally would be killer. Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I really, really sure. like this kind of cover where it's like that early successional, just thicker than <laughs> snot kind of cover. Yep. yep. <clears throat> so as far as browse in there, the, in 